inspired and you think other listeners might want to pick up and have a look at you know i've ended up in the private sector really i own and run a business now so and that's been a you know that's been a really steep learning curve again it comes from i think it's probably comes from my upbringing really that this need to occupy the middle ground and and you know moderation in my professional life and personal life when i can manage it so to balance out the fact that i i live and work in in the private sector really this book really discusses um, some socialist ideas really so it's the ragged trousered philanthropist by robert tressel i don't know if you guys have have come across that one yeah well, my mum got me a couple of years ago um, and so I've I've read the blurb and I've looked at it, but I've never actually read it. But it is a sort of a, a socialist Bible, isn't it? So what's the pretext then, Jonathan, for the listener? You know, sell it to them in two minutes. <laughs> Excellent. OK, so it's it's basically a painter and decorator that works for a range of really nasty bosses and is is sort of exploited throughout the book there's a number of monologues and you know basically it's 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 him trying to convince his colleague that life could be better because it's set you know the the book was published back in 1914 i think so w- working practices health and safety and so on, things were pretty grim back then for for a lot of folks so he was sort of painting a a, a brighter brighter picture of course they slapped him down but i, I won't ruin it by telling, telling folk how it finished it's very much about you talk about in your bio about being an eternal optimist yeah so is that what you're meaning by this you'd like to try and keep eternally optimistic about your life and your career etc i think so you have to have hope in life don't you you know it's... yeah of course yeah definitely Okay, so now it's time for our micro discussion. We've actually already touched on this today, but we were going to discuss it was in um, the PJ earlier this week, and I think you've covered it, Jonathan, in, in Pharmacy and Practice. And it's about the fact that Amazon has applied for a trademark. I think their trademark is UK Amazon Pharmacy. So it's something we've all known is coming, um, and I think it's something that some people fear it, some people welcome it, um, whatever it, it's going to entail we know it's going to shake things up um looking at the article in the pj um sandra gidley president of the royal pharmaceutical society she says medicines are not considered normal consumer items to be bought over the internet and then claire o'connell from well pharmacy perhaps surprisingly actually said in some ways she welcomes it because it will accelerate beneficial change and i guess that's where i am um i'm not saying i've necessarily welcome it as such but but what amazon do when they come into the marketplace is they completely disrupt it they they shake it up and sometimes that can be for the good i think and sometimes that for the bad but i think you know from a personal point of view i think the current repeat prescription the way we manage repeat prescriptions and pick them up and order them and get them and stuff just isn't fit for purpose anymore and so so i'm really interested to watch what happens when they do come into the marketplace so I don't know what, what you guys think. Nervous for the profession, on one hand. Uh, as a consumer, you can see the positives, I think. And I suspect we'll get onto a conversation. I did. I have listened to your podcast from December, John, as well. I thought that was excellent. And that value conversation. If you're a pharmacist listening to this podcast and you provide value for your patients and you're looking to increase and improve value and, and you understand that, then that's the angle that you need to come from, isn't it, I think? You know, it's no surprise that I that my book is The Ragged Trousered Philanthropist because with when you're when you're in business, you can get carried away and I'm 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 nowadays perpetually surrounded with people that do. That said, there is a purity about delivering a value proposition that consumers or patients will pay for become in in pharmacy particularly community pharmacy we've become so far removed from that that we find ourselves in a on a sticky wicket a wee bit and we're a bit stuck and there's big blocks in the way and amazon's going to come and and really really disrupt i mean actually amazon could be could be a bit of a red herring because there's so much activity in the private sector happening around you know adherence medicines, digital health, all this AI, you know, these companies are bypassing. I guess my concern is with all this, but they're, they're bypassing pharmacy, in inverted commas, or pharmacies, bricks and mortars. The companies are realizing that it's it's just quicker and easier to go straight to the consumers um, or, or patients, as we call them. And actually, you've got to wonder, has NHS England or the government sort of realized that and thought unlike scotland where they've sold the benefits of the network have they sort of moved on from the current model and are, and are expecting a more efficient delivery of medicine i'm not sure interested to know your thoughts i, I was being going to bring that up what you said is that that's that's where pharmacy's got to get clever now isn't it is is, is selling the benefit and I, I i don't know much about pharmacy in england other than 
the bits I read. But I think a similar thing's happening in Wales where, you know, there's a shift towards the, the public health and the pharmaceutical care role of the pharmacists and their place in the community. And that's what has got to strengthen um, if it's going to compete in a in a world where, let's face it, Amazon or whoever will be able to deliver your medicines seamlessly. I mean, the way I'm seeing it is if you're an author, Amazon's the best thing that's ever you can You can publish direct to, to the customer or to the consumer. And, and I think... That's why I say disruptive. I think what's going to happen is something we haven't even thought of because, because what, you know, you've got that framework in place that, and so I don't necessarily think it's going to be the death of community pharmacy. I don't think it is at all. It, you know, that I fear that as much as anybody, I, I think it's, it'll be a rebirth in terms of their role in the community that is less dependent on that supply function, which is a shame, but I think that's what's, that's what's going to happen. We, we are in this kind of middle ground as well. You know, something to consider is the fact that community pharmacy sometimes consider themselves as part of the NHS and then sometimes not. I think that that is a factor to consider. And we've published articles on this before. One one notable opinion piece around should community pharmacy or elements of community pharmacy like pharmacist service within a pharmacy be nationalised or contracted directly by the NHS? You know, I know that's an out there thought but that would protect the pharmaceutical care function for the record my dad was a community pharmacist and i totally get why people might feel that this is going to disrupt and i'm sure that it will what i have learned after 30 years in the nhs is that the only constant is change like all change if you just look at it with the wrong sorts of glasses on you will be on a downer and maybe it won't be good for you But I think if you have good spectacles and you look at the bigger picture, then I think that this could be good. As you say, whether you kind of call it a consumer or the patient, as we would call it, I think it will bring change. And if I'm honest, if it if it allows and I understand from reading some of this about the legal framework around hub and spoke, for example, and how that might change, if that if that allows more pharmacists who've got great access for patients you know, day in, day out, and they can then start to do more clinically focused, patient-centered, personalized care for the local community, and they get remunerated for it accordingly, I think lots of people would vote for that, both within the profession and also for patients themselves. And just to harp back, because you know I listen to a lot of podcasts, if you didn't listen to them, then do listen to the Mark Carney Wreath Lectures, which was all about how we get what we value which is exactly what you were just talking about, Jonathan. Did you prepare that? No. (laughs) That was like a a, a speech for a (laughs) election. Are you running for something? (laughs) Yeah, for the bus. RPS elections are open soon. (laughs) That's just what I think. Well, I'm impressed, so there you go. No, Stand silence are, now. Stand no, silence. You no, know, look, we could be talking about pharma. We, we, we've got Ravi coming on in a couple of episodes, haven't we? And we're going to be talking about pharmacogenomics. And so, what what role pharmacogenomics in community pharmacy in primary care? It's it's going to happen, isn't it? You know, it's happening in other countries already. And so, those exciting initiatives that aren't tethered to supply, they are real clinical added value opportunity for pharmacy and the profession to actually put their stamp on them now and be the medicines experts that I said right at the very beginning. Which we sort of disagreed with then afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> to sort of use the use the name of your podcast, though, you know, the original apothecaries, you know, if we go, go right back to then, you know, the most competent pharmacist or chemist or druggist on the high street got the business. And maybe we're maybe things are coming full circle, you know. Um, I think I suppose I come at it from a, my recent business experience. And if you're not any good, you feel, you know, so we can go too far with that, of course. But, you know, we could apply those principles to your podcast as well i mean this is today wales tomorrow you know cardiff (laughs) yeah we've got to break the scottish and northern ireland market yet i'm concerned we've been going 35 minutes and we we've only mentioned one drug and that was renitidine well that's okay we're talking about medicines medicines experts we're talking about access to medicines supply of medicines it's all medicines you could be the cleverest physician in the world if the person doesn't get their medication and they don't know how to take it and they choose not and they choose that they don't want to take it then it's all been a complete waste of time well do you want to jamie do you want to do some uh, public service broadcasting then because a a drug that's high up my agenda is subutamol and the overuse thereof that gets me quite quite animated and that's that's where a lot of um, my early prescribing work came are you still prescribing at the moment john not actively anymore no and i miss it i must admit but 
pharmacy in practice was was doing well, so I had to had to make a decision for now anyway. So what worries you about some salbutamol then, Jonathan? Uh, people using too much of it, really overusing it, relying on it. I suppose this is a bit niche into asthma. And the National Review of Asthma Deaths in 2014 published, and uh, not not much has changed really since then. To be honest, I was having that very conversation today with a person. You know, I said, would it shock you if I told you that we've issued 25 salbutamol inhalers to you in the last year? It's not the be all and end all of managing a patient, a person with asthma, but but it's a pretty good indication that things are not right. Jamie, that is not the most positive example, is it? Really, I'm, I'm not doing very well on positivity here. Pharmacy's doomed. Folk are using too much salbutamol, and and I'm worried about my indigestion. So do you know what I mean? It's not it's not going too well. Here. And you think your career is something of a chase? Yeah, and you well, you're tight for business. I can see that. <laughs> Fully booked. Sorry. <laughs> Touche, good man. Okay, thanks all. Big thank you to Jonathan for joining us on the Oral Apothecary and for sharing his stories, his Desert Island drug, his career anthem and his book. Coming up next time, we'll be joined by Ravi Sharma. Ravi is Director of the RPS for England and has a clinical interest in pharmacogenomics. Previously, Ravi was National Clinical Lead for Clinical Pharmacy and Genomics at NHS England. So we're looking forward to catching up with Ravi next time. Back to Gimo now for our contact details and the final ingredient. Okay, so um, you can email us at oralapothecarypod at gmail.com or find us on Twitter at oralapothecary. Thanks to everyone who's got in touch with us again on Twitter. It's been some, some really good conversations. So, final ingredient. You boys, clean desk or messy desk? Pretty clean. Pretty clean. Well, clean, but you were talking about tidy or... Right, okay, okay, tidy, yes. So, clean desk and tidy. Clean and tidy, clean and tidy. Yeah, Jonathan? me too. Tidy desk. T- All right, three tidies, okay, mine's messy. Okay, so, Laura Angus got in touch with us via Twitter, um, saying she's just listened to the first four episodes all in one go. Um, Come on. So thank you for that, Laura. We are the new Netflix <laughs> um, binge listening. Laura then went on to say that she was listening as she was cleaning her very messy desk. And it reminded me of a piece of research that I read about in The Independent from 2018. Research from the University of Minnesota that found that creative geniuses favour a chaotic workspace. So after testing how well participants came up with new ideas when working in both tidy and disorderly work areas, it revealed that those in the messy rooms generated the same number of ideas as the tidy rooms, but their ideas were considered far more interesting and creative. So there you go, podcasters. If your space is usually a mess, stop worrying about it, stop organising it, embrace it for what it is, because you're a genius. This was a Three Apothecaries production. Sound engineer, Jimbo Slough. Original music, Jamie Brewster. Artwork by David Baker. Thanks for listening to the Oral Apothecary Podcast. Warning, always enjoy with an alcoholic drink, especially if operating machinery.